This week's cardiology countdown will begin with a study in Jack at the number three spot that looked at warfarin dosing. As we know, this is a difficult thing where the dose of a given patient can range from 2 to 15 milligrams. And uh, we've used empiric dosing, often 5 milligrams a day, although the label and clinical factors um, also are suggested to improve picking of doses, such as age, body surface area, uh, race. And then there's genetic factors that can be um, play a role. The VORC C1 and 2C19 um, polymorphisms can play a role. And a formal pharmacogenetic um, algorithm has been developed using all the clinical and genetic factors. And so a study in Jack uh, looked at five different ways to pick a dose and found that when incorporating both the clinical and genetic factors, one could identify the ultimate uh, patient's dose more accurately in about 55% of people just with that initial dose. Now, this study didn't look at the time and therapeutic range, uh, but there is an ongoing large study sponsored by the NIH looking at genetic-based uh, warfarin dosing. And so it looks promising, and we'll stay tuned for better ways to adjust and pick the dose of warfarin. At the number two spot is a study from New York State looking at the value of stroke centers. Uh, it was seen in um, about half the patients presented with acute ischemic stroke to hospitals with the designation of a stroke center. That is, they're geared up and certified to be able to respond to acute stroke. And interestingly, this was seen to be associated with improved um, outcomes, where at 30 days, um, the all-cause mortality was 10% versus 12.5% at non-designated stroke centers, a significant difference. There was a greater use of thrombolytic therapy as one of the potential mechanisms uh, therein. And so I think a, um, a useful study validating the notion of following quality improvement initiatives. And at this week's number one spot is a study looking at suction cup CPR. So this is a, uh, an approach where doing active compression and decompression CPR has been known to improve hemodynamics by decreasing intrathoracic pressure and drawing more uh, blood into the heart during CPR. And so this was a large randomized study looking at clinical outcomes um, where um, over 2,500 patients were provisionally randomized, of whom about 1,600 were actively randomized to the two different types of CPR. And there was about a 50% improvement in survival uh, with the active compression decompression CPR. Now, unfortunately, survival was very low. It was just 6% in um, the standard group, increased to 9% in the active compression-decompression group. So a significant improvement in a very serious condition. Now, interestingly, these are two ways of doing the compressions, and there's recently some changes in whether one would do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Uh, this would be a further enhancement of the compression side of uh, CPR. And so we'll look forward to seeing whether this gets incorporated into new guidelines. So with this week's Cardiology Countdown, I'm Chris Cannon.